Okay, so good evening everyone and welcome to HONT 611 Events Management. This is our 10th session and in today's session we will be treating the topic of financing events. Now as usual there are some learning outcomes that we hope to achieve by the end of the session and today there are three points. The first one is to be able to understand some of the financial planning, control, and budgetary issues in running events. Secondly, to identify the elements of cost and revenue in managing events. And then finally, to be able to consider the critical success factors for financing events. Now, as usual, during the session, in case you have anything you need clarification or any question you want to ask, kindly draw my attention and we will address it before we proceed. So in the absence of any comment or question, we will go ahead to start the lecture. Does anyone have anything they want to ask? Or oh, everyone is good, we can begin. Yeah, good dog. Okay, okay. okay. Then let's begin. So financing events, why financing events? And we all know that events are capital or resource intensive um, occasions and when planning an event an event professional like we identified in the beginning of this course always has limits when it comes to finances and how much they have at their disposal to be able to utilize in planning and executing the event so financing events as a topic is very important for us to treat as part of this course because event professionals need to be exposed to the various cost elements that require certain amount of finances to enable the event professional effectively execute their event plans and achieve all the objectives by the end of the event. So financial planning and good financial control are important aspects of the event management process. Now, regardless of whether the event you're organizing is a small personal event like a birthday party or a get together, or a dinner party, or a huge major or mega event like the Olympic Games or a football tournament, event professionals need to know how much they have at their disposal to spend. Because as human beings, if we are not given limits, we tend to far exceed what is allotted to us. So it is very important for event professionals to know right from the onset how much they have to spend and then spend within those means. Now for the vast majority of events, there will always be income and expenditure. But we know that based on the nature of events and the different kinds of events that we organize, not every event will bring in some kind of income. For instance, you can't expect to gain income from a four-year-old birthday party or um, a bridal shower. So these are examples of events which are not included in the vast majority of events that will produce both income and expenditure. However, when we talk about events like conferences and concerts and carnivals, where perhaps people have to buy tickets to attend, pay an entrance or admission fee, there will be some form of income to juxtapose the expenditure that will be made to be able to execute the event. And for this reason, the careful monitoring, recording, and control of these incomes and expenditures is a very significant concern and should be the, the most significant responsibility of the event professional because it is an important con concept or, or issue to the clients who commissioned the event, who most of the time are the ones fully paying for or providing the finances to execute the event, as well as organizers of the event who are being tasked, and organizers here may include various vendors and suppliers who are helping by supporting with different aspects of providing either services or logistics to ensure that the event is executed. And that is also an important thing to them because that is the means by which they will be able to supply and get paid. At the same time, so coordinators and finance officers of all kinds are also very interested in, in the monitoring, recording, and control of incomes and expenditure that come with events. Because say you are organizing a conference for a professional body, that professional body will have a, a number of executives, including finance officers, 
who will be interested in how the finances that they provided for the planning and execution of the event were utilized. At the same time, too, coordinators are also interested in this to be able to know what was spent, what, uh, what it was spent on, and how to be able to ensure that what the money was spent on is put to good use. So based on this, we can see the importance of the role of finances when it comes to events management. Now, whether we like to admit it or not, like I said, finances are the core responsibility of the event professional because they have to make sure that whatever finances are provided are used judiciously. So we say that good financial control is important to the success of events. And even for those events that are not intended to be profit making. Like I mentioned earlier, even though an event like say a birthday party or a bridal shower is not bringing in any income, there is still some form of expenditure that is being made. And there will be the need for the event professional at the end of the day to account for how they expended these finances in executing the event. Therefore, some effort needs to go into providing an overview of the financial aspects of the event, both at the planning stage, during the event itself, and at the end of the event. And like I said, these are the core responsibility of the event professional and his or her team. So both revenue generating events, as well as those where the recording of outgoings against the client's budget is needed, always rely on the good control of finances to ensure that they are properly executed. Because whether the event is bringing in income or not, some money is definitely being spent to see to whether the event takes place. So this money has to be accounted for. In that regard, let's look at a generic frame for financing events. Now, this is not all encompassing, hence the term generic. So we are going to use it um, with caution, but it's given us a general foundation of how to be able to look at the financing of events and how to be able to go about it as event professionals. So please don't get scared. The diagram may look very complex, but we will break it down. So we can see that the diagram starts at the top with interest in staging an event into bracket search costs, leading to event ownership, and then branching out towards bidding and invention. Bidding on the one hand includes bidding costs and bidding benefits, which would either lead to a success or failure. And then on the other part of event ownership, we have invention, which leads to invention slash marketing costs. And then the two together converge to the point where we have hosting, the event. Now, after hosting the event, it branches out into the cost of staging the event as well as the benefits of staging the event. And then beneath, we have a number of other factors, including direct and indirect, tangible and intangible costs and benefits of staging the event, as well as organizer, non organizer related costs and benefits of staging the event to bracket hitting costs. And then we have post event costs and benefits after staging the event. And then overall cost and benefits of searching, bidding, inventing, staging of the event, and inheriting its legacy. And then on the, on the extreme right, we have the real methodology, which is not necessarily the focus of um, our session today. So we will look into the various stages up until the point where we talk about the post-event cost and benefits after staging the event. So let's take them one after the other. Starting with finding the right event to bracket search costs. Now, remember in the beginning, we talked about the fact that when you are planning an event, it is either you are the one who is unilaterally planning the event, or you are going in search of, of a, a contract to be able to plan an event. Now, remember in the beginning of our session, I again talked about what we call request for proposals. Do you remember? You should remember because I talked about it. So now I'm asking, one person should tell us what a request for proposals is. I'm waiting. Someone has to tell us before we can move forward. What is a request for proposals?
Doc, please be us. No, I can't tell you. We're all in this class together, so you have to tell me. What is the request for proposal? What is the request for proposal? I'm waiting. I'll start mentioning names. What is the request for proposals? We talked about it when we talked about the, the process of event planning. We mentioned request for proposals during that lecture. That was the lecture three. So where is the request for proposals? What is it? No one can tell us. Gloria, request for proposals. George. Yes, Blair. Please, is it, um, is it a document used in soliciting for funds? It's used in soliciting for something, but not funds. Okay. Look at the name of the document and think of, of it as in terms of the event professional. Still no one. So during that lecture, I talked about the fact that when someone commissions an event, assuming the event was not designed from scratch by the event professional themselves, and someone else came up with the idea of organizing a particular event, but they are not event professionals and they will need event professionals to guide them to organize the event. They would issue what we call a request for proposals, given basic specifications of the events that they want to stage. And then they'll ask prospective event professionals to bring in proposals on how they'll go about organizing the event. And that is a request for proposals. So as an event professional, if you have not come up with your own event, you need to look out for event requests for proposals to help you to be able to get jobs to do. Otherwise, you will just be sitting there as an event professional and no jobs will come your way. So you actively go in search of these jobs. And one way of, of finding some of these jobs is by looking out for requests for proposals. And once you find it and you send your proposal, if you are successful and you pass the first stage, the client will usually call for the successful applicants to come and bid for the event. And bidding involves giving a budget as to how much you are going to need to be able to execute all the plans and the fantastic things you've talked about in your proposal that you are going to do. And at the bidding stage is where the client will decide, okay, based on how much they say they, they, they can execute it for and, and what they said they will do, we will go with this group over this group. So, when you are an event professional, you need to be able to know what is going on in the marketplace and what jobs are available in respect of organizing events. That is why we are saying that before even bidding for an event, the event professional needs to understand what is going on in the market by filtering. Because if you do not understand what is going on in the marketplace, the kind of events that are being organized, the upcoming events, you will not even know which ones to bid for. So by going through the process of searching and filtering, you, the event professional, gets linked up with the right events that you can organize. And that is why the search for the right event by the event professional or the right venue for an event by the event professional is linked to search costs. Because you incur certain amounts of money to be able to find these requests for proposals, as well as to be able to get information as to events that are being um, organized or staged. 
So for instance, to be able to keep up with, with the, the um, happenings in the events management industry, and to be able to make sure that you are in the best position to send out proposals, to bid, to organize prospective events, you need to be able to, running a, to be running a good office where you have assistants who can help you put together all this documentation, where you can have assistants and other event professionals you work with who will be looking out for these various requests for proposals that you can apply for. And that is an element of course, because you need to get office space. You need to get office equipment. You need to pay your employees on a daily basis. You need to pay for light. You need to pay for water. All these are cost elements. And in the event that perhaps you need to be able to travel to get certain information about the event um, market in your particular town or particular country, you may incur some traveling expenses. Sometimes some event professionals even visit exhibitions and conventions to be able to get a sense of what is happening and to be able to look for new clientele. All of these will incur traveling expenses. At the same time too, you may also incur some expenses for promotion. Promotion in terms of how you promote yourself and make people aware of your business and how you, you can be able to execute events for them as an event professional. So promotional elements such as perhaps newspaper adverts to advertise your business, your event organizing or management business, as well as perhaps social media adverts to promote your business. All of these will incur some level of cost, hence the term search costs. And in doing all these things too, you are expending time Right? When your team meets to take decisions internally at the office, you sit down for a certain period of time, brainstorming how best to write the proposal, how best to get that next event organizing gig. Right? And you also incur money to be able to tender your proposals in to even make it to the next stage for bidding. Because you have to be able to wow the prospective clients with your, with your prospective bid. So some event professionals will go ahead and perhaps include I've seen um, bids that have been made by various professionals where they have even included handheld tablets with, loaded with pictures and videos of events that they have organized just to give the prospective client an idea of, of what they are capable of and what they can do. Those who can't afford the tablet too, I've seen bids where they have included flash drives loaded with pictures and videos of events that they have organized before and how excellently they did. All of these things are cost elements because as soon as you decide to include a tablet, tablets are costly. They will cost a minimum of 500 Ghana CDs and above. Flash drives also equally come at, at a high cost depending on, on the number of gig that that flash drive is. So all these things are cost elements that come into, into, into into, into perspective when the event professional is thinking about finding the right event to organize. Now, from the diagram that we saw, we saw that after the event professional has been able to get into the search mode and start searching for events that they could probably organize, we go to the next level of what we call event ownership. And at the event ownership level, it branches out into the bidding level and the invention level. Now, after you have been able to put in a proposal or say, identify a prospective proposal of what you want to be able to do, you, a, a prospective request for proposal, sorry, of what you want to be able to do as an event professional or the event you want to be able to organize, you either go into the mode of invention or bidding. Now, bidding is where someone has issued their request for proposals and you are sending in a proposal in response to their request for proposals to see if you will be selected to host the event. And usually when proposals come in, they are evaluated and the client will choose say two or three or four finalists depending on their preferences and ask those finalists to present a final bid with a budget. Now once they do that, the bidding process involves both costs and benefits. Because it's not every bid that you tender that you will win. Sometimes you will lose. But by bidding, you may get known. So in the events that another event or organizing opportunity comes up and they think that 
you are um, fit enough for it, then they will recommend you. But you will not always succeed on the first try. However, there are a number of, of costs to involve. Like I said, there are so many different things that people put as part of their, their bidding proposals for to enhance their chances of getting selected. But on the other hand, if you are not responding to someone's proposal and you are coming up with your own event, then we refer to that as invention, which we can see here. Now, invention also comes with its own costs. But before we get to that, we need to understand that every event has an owner. And most of today's events that we witness are all owned by specific people, be it groups, organizations, or individuals. For instance, December to Remember is owned by, by the City Group. So the, city, the owners of City TV and City Radio are the ones who own December to Remember. Adum Praise is owned by the Multimedia Group. The Rappaholic Concert is owned by Sarkodie and his team. So you realize that each of the events that we see today are owned by someone. So for this reason, when we talk about financing an event, event ownership comes into play. Because depending on who owns the event, you will be able to clearly see where the finances for organizing the event will come from. So when we talk about event ownership and financing of events, the first question that we ask is, who owns the rights to this event? And the second question will be to ask, who is footing the cost for the event? Because someone may be an owner for an event, but they do not put in finances to stage the event. They prefer to perhaps rely solely on external income and, and, and sponsors to be able to finance the event. So in event ownership, whether you are the inventor or you are just bidding, you need to ask yourself, how the costs are going to be distributed. And we can see here that it says part of the cost of staging an event is incurred either through bidding or in the case of a new event as invention costs. Because like I said, if you are not the owner, you as the event professional will incur some costs when you are bidding. And as I mentioned earlier, I've seen so many interesting things that um, event professionals and other kinds of professionals who are bidding for all manner of opportunities to host events or to stage something have put in place to be able to ensure that they win the bid or enhance their chances of winning. And they have done a number of things. Like I said, I've seen bids that have included handheld tablets before, bids that have included flash drives before. Some people too may not include a tablet or a flash drive, but they, they include a publication, a small book, that is well designed with images of all the events that they have organized before and all the, the fancy things that they did to ensure that the event was a success. So when it comes to event ownership and financing events, there are two main scenarios in this regard. Scenario one, when you're asking about finances, is where there is an event owner. Because like I said, there may not always be an event owner. So where there is an event owner, there is usually a standardized candidate procedure, like I said. The owner of the event will send out a request for proposal, right? And then through bidding, they'll be able to select the best candidate by checking the bidders and their potential to be able to successfully host the event. And as I've amply explained, there are so many ways by which this can be done on the side of the event owner and on the side of the event professional. Now, the event owner will often have a mandatory list detailing all the requirements for the organization of the event, which is binding for the event professional upon signing the organizing agreement. Because part of the bidding process involves the owner looking for someone who can be able to execute their vision as they have seen it. So when you are bidding for, for, for an event and you go for a proposal, as an event professional, you need to know that the event owner is the one who will ultimately dictate how the final event is staged. And this is in the scenario where there's an event owner. However, in the scenario where there is not an event owner, even if the event is being staged for the first time and it's completely new, there will still be some kind of invention costs. And in this case, 
The invention cost could either be incurred on the part of the prospective owner who is different from the event professional or on the part of the event professional himself. In the case where the event professional is the one who is originally creating and designing the event, like you, you were commissioned to do in your first assignment. Now, the best part about this particular scenario is that because there's no event owner who is now looking for a prospective event professional to organize the event, there are no bidding costs because you don't have to go through the bidding process. But then after the event has been successfully introduced, the person who came up with most of the ideas and wants to be able to benefit from the event into the future has to put in place some mode of actions to be able to ensure that they gain ownership of the event and protect their rights. Otherwise, if they do not do so, anyone can come from anywhere at any time and take over the event and say that they are also organizing it. And it will be fair because the original person who came up with the idea or invented it did not take steps to obtain ownership. Like for instance, Adun Prince was originally the brainchild of a very good friend of ours in media. At that time, he was working for multimedia. Then something happened and then he stopped working for multimedia. But because he, even though he came up with the idea for Adun Prince, he did not take steps to take ownership. When he left multimedia, he had to leave Adun Prince behind. And now I don't praise the property of multimedia because at the time that he came up with the idea and implemented it, he was working for multimedia. So he didn't have any rights or ownership to the event. But assuming he had registered the event or gotten some rights and ownership to it, upon leaving, he could have decided to leave with, with the whole concept of I don't praise and organize it himself. Or he could have decided, okay, since I'm leaving your company, I'm willing to sell the rights to I don't praise to you as multimedia to continue organizing it, right? And if multimedia had given him an offer he did not like, they have said, okay, I'm taking my thing away. I would organize um, a request for proposals to get people to bid to organize the event on my behalf. So this is the second scenario where there is not an event owner and a new event is, is, is totally um, created and developed from scratch for prospective organization. Please, does it make sense? Yes, John. Okay, so those are the two scenarios. Now, beyond event ownership, we talked about bidding and invention costs that I have just explained. Now, with the invention costs, there can be so many of them. For instance, the cost that you incur in studying the feasibility of the event. Remember, we talked about the fact that when you are creating and designing an event, you need to be able to see if it is feasible. Is someone else organizing a similar event? The time frame within which I want to organize it, are there similar competing events that will worry me at that time? And is it feasible? Can I get people to attend this event if I indeed go ahead and stage it? Invention costs also include thinking about the cost of funding the event in terms of finding investors. Perhaps you were smart enough to come up with the event concept, but you do not have enough money to, to fund it or even to get the people to, to sit down and help you refine and create the design properly in a manner that can be executed flawlessly. So you need to also incur some costs to find investors. And finding investors is a whole process involving sending out proposals, writing letters, having meetings, doing lunches, doing dinners. It's, it's, a, it's a whole procedure that will require a significant amount of and in the case that it is a huge event that you will require the participation of certain actors, for instance, sportsmen, artists, like we learned with the, um, the Chaliwate um, Street Art Festival, you will incur some, some cost as well because you may have to visit the workplaces and the locations of all these individual actors and speak to them and convince them to be able to come and participate. Right? You may also need to incur some some resources or some financial resources to be able to promote the event to see how the prospective audience will, will be able to to appreciate the event and perhaps participate in it and these are all invention costs because before an invention an event is commissioned you need to be able to do a feasibility study among your prospective audience as well as among 
particular media outlets that will cover the event should it take place to be able to see if indeed it is something that is worth their while they'll be willing to participate in so that is it for the various kinds of invention costs that you can find so on the basis of understanding bidding and inventing as well as the cost and benefits that go with each let's talk about the cost and benefits of hosting and organizing events now after you have been able to successfully bid for an event or invent an event and you have been able to find investors who believe in the idea and you decide to stage it. You then begin the planning and preparation phase to be able to see to it that by the time the D-Day comes, you are ready to stage the event. And this is one of the main drivers for delivering a successful event. Because if you have not properly planned and prepared, you cannot be able to successfully organize the event. Sorry. And planning and preparation involves incurring various amounts of costs and spending various amounts of money to ensure that the planning and preparation is executed without a hitch. Therefore, understanding the real costs of an event during the bidding phase is very difficult because you have not even won the contract yet. So at that point, everything that you are putting in your bidding proposal is perhaps an estimate or a fair idea of what you think it might cost or what you think you have to expend to be able to ensure that the event is executed successfully. And we all know that when you start planning an event, things can change. Environmental factors can be a contributing factor to the various changes that may occur during the event planning process, such that perhaps the, the location that you even chose could change as, as you go along the way and, and alter some parts of the cost implications that you, you anticipated during the bidding process. In our last session, we also talked about the issue of risk and how that alone can also bring about additional costs during the event planning process. So because of the forecasting element and the estimation element, it is very difficult for you as an event professional to get reliable data when you are bidding. So you need to be able to ensure that when you are bidding, you make adequate provision for all these contingencies that may, may come up. Because there's the possibility that once you finish the bidding process and you win the contract, what you anticipated may have changed. And once you've won the contract, the client will still expect you to deliver, regardless of the changes that have to be taking place in the environment, including the kinds of risks that have been presented, the levels of inflation, exchange rates going up, all manner of things can happen. Perhaps even regulation can change. So based on that, the event professional has to be able to appreciate the evolutionary nature of costs during the bidding process. And then once the planning and preparation process towards the organizing of the event starts. Now, on the basis of what we just discussed, the courts elements that we have identified could come in either a direct or indirect form. Likewise, the benefits. And some of these may be tangible while others are intangible. So here we are saying it is crucial to understand not only the events, direct costs and benefits in terms of the revenues and income, but also the costs and benefits that are not related to you, the event organizer and what you are doing. Because like I said, there are various elements of cost that will come into play, some of which are based on the environment and the context. For instance, certain kinds of risk, certain kinds of environmental factors, certain kinds of legal and regulatory factors. All of these may pose cost implications that are not directly related to the event organizer, but they will affect the planning and successful execution of the event. So there is a need for the event professional to appreciate both the tangible and intangible costs and benefits, to be able to adequately plan and prepare for them so that he or she is not taken by surprise. So when we talk about tangible costs and benefits, they are basically those that monetarily impact the stakeholder groups that are related to the event that you are organizing as an event professional, right? And on the other hand, the intangible costs of the benefits are the ones 
that are difficult to quantify. You can't quantify them in monetary terms. But then again, there are some kind of costs that you have to incur. For instance, assuming you have a client who want a bid to organize their event, and the client has given you a certain budget to be able to organize the event. The budget is totally fine. The money is enough to be able to successfully organize the event. But this client has certain interesting requirements of you. For instance, they expect you to be able to pick your, pick your calls every time that they give you a call, regardless of, of daytime, midnight, any hour of the day, you should be able to respond to their call. And whenever they call you for a meeting, you're expected to show up, regardless of when, where, and how. So in this case, would you say what I'm describing now is a cost element? The client's requiring you to pick up your phone call at any odd time of the day, showing up for every meeting you are invited to, whenever it is, whatever it is about, you have to show up. Would you see it as a cost element? Yes, please. Yes, please. Would you call it tangible or intangible? Intangible. Okay, please, why? Because it cannot be measured. Good. It's, it's some... You know, go ahead, Gloria. Yeah, it's something you cannot measure. So uh, whether the call you cannot uh, predict or cannot say this amount of money if used to uh, make the call or receive the call. And exactly. the transportation can exactly. also not... Perhaps even the transportation, you put it in the budget for transportation. But even the stress. Yeah. The stress of perhaps having to pick a million and one phone calls a day. All this is not not quantifiable, but it's a cost that you are incurring, right? And this may have a significant impact not only on you, the event professional, but also on stakeholders. So when we talk about stakeholders here, even your family is included. Would you agree that your family are stakeholders in, in, in the events that you organize? Would you agree? Perhaps if, if you um, bless we're an event professional, and I, I'm telling you, you are an event professional, and I'm telling you that your family constitutes part of the stakeholder group that are impacted by these tangible things. Would you agree? Yes, please. Yes, I will. Because, because um, will. okay, so because as we speak now, at the moment, I'm the only person with them in the house. So if you call me, if you don't arrange a meeting with me and for me to um, arrange for somebody to look after them or let daddy come home early and you call me at this time, I'll have problems leaving them alone. And that can, I mean, that can cause emotional stress on them. And, exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly. And some event professionals will argue that because this is not quantifiable, we cannot put it in the budget. Do you agree? Yes, we do. So you agree that it shouldn't be part of the body? Mm, I, but madam, how will you put it in the budget? Good. How will you... Good. Where are the accountants? Mercedes. Yes. Yeah. How will you put something like this in the budget? Please, you can't put it in the budget. You can't. Are you sure? Message is an issue. Uh, hmm. Okay. Has anyone heard of miscellaneous costs? Okay. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> so it's miscellaneous. These, okay. Good. Because these are things that are intangible. You can't quantify them. But if they ask you what you put in the miscellaneous, you can explain. But they are not items that you can actively involved in your budget. But they are largely intangible, right? So let's look at this grid that's showing us examples of tangible and intangible cost elements, as well as short and long-term cost elements. Look at something like know-how. All the intelligence and the experience that you have gained over the years from organizing all these events, cooking for all these events as a caterer, they have. No one is paying for that intellect, are they? 
Are they no. paying for that intellect? No. No. So you have to put it in the budget somehow, either under miscellaneous or under professional consulting fee or something. But it has to be put in. Right? So we have things like know-how. And here they are, they are looking at it in a broad sense. So there are various events that are captured here. Thinking of image of event nation, assuming it is, an, it's, it, it is a, something like the World Cup or the Olympic Games that is being hosted by a particular country. The image of the event nation will come into play here as part of the benefits that they, they are likely to gain by organizing the event day, among others. I'll leave the diagram so that when you get the chance, you can sit down and go, go through all of it. Right? And in the event that perhaps it is something like the Olympic Games or the African Cup of Nations that resulted in the construction of new stadia and new roads, there'll be tangible benefits like infrastructure, infrastructure development, tourism and superstructure because a lot of tourists will come into the country, they'll spend money and you, you earn um, income for, for the country to improve the GDP, right? Sports infrastructure, like I said, during the, the, the time Ghana hosted the Confederation of, of, of African Nations, they put up a lot of sports um, infrastructure, including stadia, to ensure that they could properly stage the event. Right? So it is, it is very important that you as an event professional find a way of factoring both tangible and intangible costs into, into the, the budget that you eventually prepare. Because these are all elements of expenditure, whether you like to acknowledge them or not. Now let's talk about organizer versus non-organizer related costs, also known as hidden costs. Now the organization of an event not only creates costs for the organizers, being the event professional and their team and the clients, but also for the local community. For instance, like I said, a lot of people organize huge events and parties in neighborhoods, and they forget that their neighbors are stakeholders in the event that is being organized. So in as much as there are certain costs that they are incurring, the neighbors are also incurring certain costs. So let me give you a scenario and then you, you please tell me some of the hidden costs that the, the, the non-organizer in this case is incurring. So here I'm saying that, for instance, if it's a neighborhood party being held by one person living in a particular neighbor, they are the organizers of the event. However, there are neighbors who are not participating in organizing the event are also in carrying certain kinds of costs. So here is the scenario. We are organizing a party in, in Mercedes neighborhood, but we don't tell Mercedes neighbors. A Mercedes next door neighbor has a big space in front of his house. So during our party, a lot of our guests parked their cars in front of his house. They sat in their cars, they ate a lot of food, left the, the takeaway packs, drink bottles and cans, all over the front of his driveway. In fact, during the time that the party was being had, his entire driveway was blocked. In this scenario, what are the hidden costs? What are the hidden costs in this scenario? The neighbor having to clean um, in front of his house after the event. Good, that's one. And there's another one, but a more important one. Messi, did you want to try? Yes. Um, the parking of uh, cars in front of his house. Good. Inconvenient. On the driveway, yeah. Convenient. Convenient. Yes. So for the entire period of the party, if it was four, five, six hours, the neighbor was logged in, in his or her house. Right? So these are hidden costs, but they are being in care. Let's look at another set of, of, of costs, being event-related and non-event-related. So for instance, event-related costs are explained as those costs that are caused by the organization of the event and potentially have a multiplier effect, and usually long-term effects. Right? So they are specifically they can be directly linked to the event that is being organized. Like for instance, hiring chairs and tables for a wedding reception, hiring a caterer. These are all direct event related costs. 
However, there are other non-event related costs as well, which may occur specifically because of the event. But perhaps they would have been incurred anyway, even if the event had not taken place. So for instance, the scenario we just gave, perhaps if the party hadn't taken place, someone randomly would have been, would have parked in front of the neighbor's house, true or false? Out of the blue. True. Yeah. It would have happened true. anyway, but it, it, it also happened as a result of the event being organized. So that's an example of a non-event related cost, which may occur specifically as a result of the event, or perhaps we have incurred any. Looking at it on the scale of mega and major events, like for instance, the Olympic Games and the, um, the Confederation of African Nations. During the Confederation of, of African Nations, the Ghanaian government was bashed a lot because they all of a sudden started renovating a lot of sporting infrastructure that had been neglected for so many years. For instance, the Cape Coast Stadium had been ignored for so many years. Who knew that? You didn't know that. No, please. Okay. So the Cape Coast Stadium and the Kumasi Sports Stadium had not seen renovation in so many years. But all of a sudden, because the, the games were about to be held, they had to renovate all these things because international players were coming, international officials were coming, and they had to make sure that the infrastructure was up to par. Right? But these are costs that would have been incurred anyway because games or no games, the country has to have functional stadia, functional sports facilities, so that people who actually play the sports in the country can be able to benefit. Another typical example is a birthday party. I'm having a birthday party in my house. I haven't painted my house for, say, a year or two. But because of the birthday party, people are coming to the house. So I decide to paint the, the outside wall to make it look nice. This is a non-event related cost because I painted because the party was coming up. But ultimately, without the party, I would have still had to paint my house anyway, eventually. True or false? True. Good. So that's another typical example. But related cost. Yes, bless. Hello. Okay. But you said um Hello, Doc. I can hear you. You said you, you are painting it because of the party. Yes, oh. I could have painted it eventually, but because of the party... I'm was... asking, you said you were painting it because of the party. No, I said I painted it so that when people come to the house during the party, they won't see that it is, it is bad. But if I was not having the party, okay. I would have still painted the house anyway. Okay. But perhaps I would have waited a bit longer. Okay. You get it. So with yes, the party, I would have still painted my house. Okay. And that is the explanation okay. for an event-related course. They may occur specifically as a result of an event, but would have occurred anyway. You get it. Okay. Yes, I do. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so for organizer related costs, like we have explained earlier, these are visible costs and could comprise of the operational costs for staging the event. So like I said, logistics like hiring tables, hiring chairs, hiring stage trusses, and there could also be other costs like security, transportation to and from the venue, paying for the venue, right? And pre-event operations that will take place, like perhaps the place may have to be scrubbed down place may have to be decorated, right? It may have to um, be, some wiring will have to be laid, some wireless equipment will have to be installed. These are all forms of organizer-related costs and visible costs. Because if you choose a venue that doesn't offer it to you, you have to be able to provide it. And then hidden costs are those services that are absorbed by, say, public institutions, or those costs that are absorbed by stakeholders that are not directly related to the organizer. And those are hidden costs. Okay, so now 
let's move on to a different topic and start talking about critical success factors for financing events. Now, the first thing we need to talk about is event budgeting. And like we have identified, any element that introduces some level of expenditure that constitutes an expense needs to be factored into the overall financial estimates for the event. And to be able to accurately estimate or forecast how much it will cost you to successfully stage an event, you need what we call an event budget. Now, a budget, we say, is a forecast or plan which helps to regulate the operation of an event or any business over a given period of time. So the budget is both a forecast of what is intended to happen and a record of what is happening. Or after the event of what had happened. So like I said, there's a is a kind of budget that you prepare to be able to enter the bid. And once you become successful with your bid, and you have further details and specifications about the event that you have been recruited to organize, you may need to update the event and start keeping a, a record of what you are actually spending in organizing the event. And perhaps after the event, you will come to a final conclusion and include every item of expenditure that you incurred throughout the process of organizing the event. So the budget acts as a financial guide and a means of comparing what you forecasted when you were bidding for the event or the initial stages of planning the event with the reality of what you are actually spending on the event. As well as the set targets that the organizers can strive to achieve. And the organizers here include the event professional and the client who commissioned the event. Because in developing the budget, you had certain targets. And the budget was developed in accordance with those targets. So while you are going along the planning and preparation and execution stage, you need to make sure that the targets that you have that are directly linked to the budgets that you prepared are each being executed and achieved. So in terms of event budgeting, it is a method of controlling expenses and costs because it helps you to establish clear lines of responsibility about who can or cannot spend money. And like I said, the budget starts with your targets. And once you have your targets, you know how much you are spending on each target. You are able to tell whoever is supposed to be working towards achieving each of the targets, how much they can spend, and how much they cannot spend. So in the, with the mind that the budget is a guide and a blueprint that is helping those responsible for specific targets to know whether they are on course towards achieving it or not, you, the event professional, have to make sure that you understand the budget that is prepared and you continuously track it and evaluate it and discuss it with the various people who are responsible for various elements within the budget so that they can be you can be sure that they are all doing their part towards achieving what has been stipulated with regards to the budget so in regard to responsibilities towards achieving targets and how the budget can serve as a guide towards ensuring that everyone fulfills their responsibility we can say that the budget can be split into three parts First, we have the revenue budget, which is a target for how much income you are supposed to bring in. So if this income perhaps is in the form of selling tickets or entrance fees at the gate or admission fees being paid, the revenue budget serves as a guide to the team responsible for achieving the targets for the revenue budget to know how much they are expected to bring in as a result of perhaps selling the tickets or collecting the admission fees to reach the targets for that particular element within the budget. You could also have a publicity budget for the marketing staff who are responsible for promoting and publicizing the event that you are organizing so that they'll know exactly how much they have to spend on publicity and marketing promotions so that they do not get excited and exceed the budget that they have been given. And then most importantly, we have the operations budget which involves the budgets for the people who are directly involved in planning and organizing the event. So they have to make sure that 
they are working within the means of the financial resources they have been given to procure everything from the decorations to the chairs and the tables, the equipment, among other resources that they need to have in place to ensure that the event can come off successfully without a hitch. And that is it for event budgeting. Now, like I said, the revenue aspect of the budget in, in, involves taking notes and forecasting all the possible cash inflows that the event will generate. And like we established earlier, not every event will, will be bringing in income. So this is specifically for those events that bring in some form of income. Now, there are several possible sources of revenue for such events. For instance, the first one we can talk about is event owner funding. I remember in the beginning, we were having one of the discussions and you said that as event professionals, if you were organizing an event and there was some short of finances, you will invest yourself and put your personal resources in it and then let the client pay you later, which I advise you strongly against. But event owner funding is one of the main sources of revenue for an event budget. Because like I said, if the owner of the event is not the same as the organizer, the organizer needs finances to, to run the event and ensure that it comes off without a hitch. And perhaps the owner of the event does not want funding from external sources such as sponsorships or sale of tickets. And we usually see this when it comes to those events that are being organized on a small scale and on a personal scale, like birthday parties and dinner parties. These are usually catered for and paid for solely by the client or the owner of the event being the one who commissioned it. So here the owner of the event can provide everything from perhaps a venue where the event should be organized or accommodation for the people who will be attending the event, assuming it's an overnight event or these people are coming from afar. And perhaps if the owner of the event has some rights to setting television and marketing or media outlets, they'll be able to use that to also support in promoting and publicizing the event. The number two source of revenue, which I believe it should be the number one, and the first point of call is sponsorships. And sponsorships can come from both local, national, and global sources. Suppliers can also provide some kind of revenue, and here yeah, this revenue is provided in the form of value in kind sponsorships. So here they are not necessarily giving you physical cash, but they are supplying you with certain crucial resources for you to be able to organize an event. So if you have Coca-Cola as your sponsor, perhaps for the Chaskele children's um, event during the festival, and they say we cannot give you money, but we can provide Coca-Cola soft drinks to refresh everybody who comes for the event. That is an example of, of revenue through um, suppliers. Then uh, a more straightforward source of revenue at number four, which is ticket sales, also can manifest in the form of admission fees and gate fees, these are all within the same ballpark. Then we can also talk about participation fees, which are usually collected from vendors and participants during events. They have someone who wants to have use that event as a platform to speak or do some kind of display for the people who will be in attendance. And then we can also talk about VIP hospitality packages. And this often happens with a lot of events that we see. They will organize the event and they will say ticket prices are say 100 Ghana CDs for single, 150 Ghana CDs for couples, and then 300 Ghana CDs for VIP. That's an example of a VIP package. So VIP perhaps may have something slightly different from the regular attendee, but will have to pay a premium price for that. And that's an extra source of revenue for the event organizer. Another source of revenue could be the selling of advertising space, parking, or other fees, such as broadcasting fees. So for instance, if you, the event professional, built a website for the event that is coming up, definitely there'll be a lot of traffic to the website. So you can decide to sell website space to various companies who want to advertise on the page to be able to take advantage of the large number of people who will be visiting the websites to read about the event. And that's an example of selling advertising space. Also, you can decide that during the event, you will charge people for professional parking. So for a small fee, they can have their cars professionally parked and then adequate security provided for the cars. And that is another source of revenue. A potential source of revenue could also be donations. And these ones are usually unsolicited. They're usually giving out of the philanthropy and the free will of individuals and institutions who want to support. 
So perhaps an organization like the University of Ghana Business School can decide to donate some amount of money to support the Chaskeli Children's um, event just to show their support for um, the transference of culture and the interest of the children. Um, and that is an example of a donation. Then another source of revenue could be special programs. A lot of national and international bodies provide funding for various kinds of events. So for instance, the Chaskele Children's and Festival can write to the United Nations Education, Science and Cultural Organization that is usually interested in things that have to do with culture and the propagation of, of culture across generations. To, to give them some kind of grant or funding to be able to execute the event. And this, this body forms part of the United Nations, which is an international body that takes care of special programs like this. Then you can also talk about contributions from tourism. And specifically here we are referring to tourism organizations and boards who are set up specifically to promote such events. So Ghana to the world, for instance, can call on the Ministry of Tourism and the Ghana Tourist Authority, the Ghana um, Tourism Authority to come and support in one way or another to help them to be able to successfully execute the event, given that it is targeted at Ghanaians and other Africans from the diaspora. And it, it, it will help to be able to boost the GDP of the country should it be successfully executed. So these are some examples of possible revenue um, sources that we can talk about. So let's look at a typical example of an event budget. And here we can see that the event budget is made up of a number of, of sections. Now, you can see here that directly on the right of the income and expenditure items is the budget. And then directly next to the budget items is the actual amount spent. And you see that right on top of budget, they've written forecast, and then on top of the actual amount, they've written actual. And this flows directly from what I said in the beginning, that the amount that you forecast during the bidding process does not necessarily translate throughout planning and organizing the event. Because there are various environmental as well as other factors that come into play that can sometimes alter the budget that was originally forecast. So it's very important, like we said during the event budgeting discussion, to be able to track and update this document as you go along so that you can be able to see the difference between what you forecasted and what you actually spent during the planning and organizing and execution of the event. So we can see that the, the budget starts with the name of the event, the date of the event, the date on which the budget was prepared, as well as the number of attenders, those guests who are attending and are paying. And then it has the forecast column and the actual column. <coughs> Sorry. And then it also comes down immediately to start stating the sources of income or revenue. So yeah, the revenue, they have things like ticket sales, catering, income from concession stand rental. You can see that it's income from vendors. And then they run a raffle as well. And then any others you can specify, right? And those are what constitutes the income or the, the revenue side. Now, assuming this budget was for an event that is not designed to generate income, what will we place in that income section? Say this budget was for something like a children's birthday party. What will we place under the income section in preparing the budget? What will we place under the income section? Hello. Hello, we are here. Yeah, what will we place under the income section? Assuming this event was not um, one of, 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 of a form that we are selling tickets and, and, and getting uh, income from vendors renting stands. What will go into the income section? Madam, let me try. Please go ahead. What of the uh, sponsors? 
this is an event that is not being organized. It's not a commercial event. Okay. It's a private event. But sponsors is one that can go under this one. If it's if this is a commercial event, yes. So sponsors will be included. What I want to know is if the event is non-commercial. And doc, there no, may be we'll any income. Ada. We'll put ADA and we'll specify. What will you specify under the other? Hmm. Because in fact, other should not come there at all. Hmm. Self income. <laughs> so refine hmm. it. Refine it from self income. You are getting close. Refine it. Hmm. Oh. Refine it. Can you say amount to spend? Amount to spend or amount provided by client. Right? Because even though it's not income and revenue, you need to have some money to be able to peg your expenditure against. True or false? True. True. Good. So amount to spend or amount provided by client or, or client's budget or client spend just to be able to see how much the client agreed to spend on the event in the beginning, because that has to be captured for the budget to be complete. Otherwise, where are you getting the money from to pay for all the expenditure items that you are going to list down here? And there's a likelihood that the money that the, the client gave you in the beginning, he may decide to top up, true or false? True. Yes. So perhaps in the beginning, the client will say that, okay, I'm giving you 10,000 Ghana CDs to organize this party for 50 people. And then they come along the way, and then during the event, they realize that, okay, it's the same 50 people, but the 10,000 is not enough. We don't have enough um, chairs to do the social distancing. Can we get more? And then he'll top up. So that means that the top up that was added will reflect in the actual. Right? So there should be some element of income, even if it is not revenue from ticket sales and, and, and catering and uh, renting out of, of stands to vendors, some income must come in. And for a non-commercial event, it will usually come from the event owner or the client. Now, moving on to expenditure. For expenditure, there is plenty of items you can talk about. The venue hire, the staff and labor, the advertising, printing posters and tickets, the um, custom uh, attire in case you decide to share t-shirts and uniforms, uh, food, drink, entertainment, refuse removal and cleaning of the, of the location, floristry, prizes, assuming it is a commercial event that involves some uh, competitions, right? Audiovisual equipment, among others. These are all elements of expenditure that constitute what? Cost. And I remember when I was working in this particular institution, I used to help organize events. It was an academic institution. And most of the events that we had was on our premises. So we own the event. We set a budget that we are willing to spend on the event. But then when we are doing our expenditure, we cost the venue higher separately. Even though we are having it on the school's premises. Why do you think so? Why do you think we used to do that? Why do you think we used to do that? We were the event owners. We were the ones paying for it. But we will still cost the venue as part of the expenditure. Why do you say so? Why do you think we, we used to do so? No, please, I, I, I don't understand this very well. So for instance, I said I was working at an institution. It was an academic institution. And we used to have yes. a lot of events. But they were more of um, com conferences and meetings. So we would give an amount of money that we were going to spend on the event. However, when preparing our expenditure, usually someone will say, if you are having it in your, in your own building, then it is what? Then the venue is what? If you're having it in your own building, then the venue is what? It's free. It's free, yeah. 
Yes, but we will cost the venue as part of the expenditure. Okay, so maybe you do that. Be um, the venue is not available or Okay, I'm waiting. No, I was saying that maybe just in case the venue the venue is not available or for miscellaneous. Exactly. Something may happen. And we may have to move the event from our premises outside. So we have to have money set aside so that in case that happens, we can do what? Pay for it. Very good, bless. Please, do we get it? Thank you. Yes, please. So you have to be very smart in terms of designing your budget. Otherwise, if you are a kind-hearted event professional like Mercedes, you will end up putting all your money into organizing people's events, and they will not see why they have to pay you back. Because they didn't ask you to put your money inside. But if you have thought of all these things, and you have factored them in as cost elements, under expenditure, when they fall due, you know that there's an element of the budget that is set aside to address that specific issue. Does it make sense? Yes. Yes, sir. Good. I'm glad you understand now. Right. So once you have a, a general budget like this, you can stop there. Or some people will go further and specifically create a kind of balance sheet kind of uh, budget where they do the debit credits assets and liabilities and then try and balance the books and they break down each element of cost and what specifically goes into each of the elements so you realize that previously the ones that we had were general the ticket sales was general catering was general income from concession stand rentals was general raffle was general but in the second kind of budget, the detailed one, they have breakdowns and summaries of everything. So the ticket sales, they are talking about the different levels of ticket sales that they are doing. Remember I mentioned the fact that in Ghana here, a lot of the events will say they are selling tickets for what? Individuals, couples, and what? Individuals, couples, and what? VIP. VIP, good. But here they have individuals, family, group, and then discounts and elders, right? So you need to be able to see the expected amount of revenue from sales of tickets for each of these groups. Perhaps you're expecting about 100 individuals, about four families or 10 or 20 families, about 15 groups, and perhaps about 10 or 20 elders. You need to be able to focus for all these things. And under the catering, they, they have things like restaurant food because they'll be selling restaurant food, they'll be selling restaurant drinks, and then they'll, be, they'll set up an arena coffee bar where they'll be serving coffee. And they'll be serving a number of extras in the hospitality area. All of these things are sources of income for them. Then under the income from concession stand rentals, they are planning on giving stands out to people to come and sell ice cream. And then people who sell general retail stuff, so perhaps clothing, shoes, bags, amongst other things, right? And then the raffle, I think the event is going to be over two days. So they are going to do a Saturday raffle and a Sunday raffle. And then the other uh, element of, of, of income that you're expecting is from the parking. Remember I talked about the fact that you can charge a small fee for parking to help people get professional parking and then they have to provide security for the, the, their cars until they are ready to leave. Likewise, we can see in the expenditure section, they break down each of the levels of expenditure. So under venue hire, they break it down into more detail where they are, they are budgeting for how much to spend on the staff and labor, the wages of the staff, the meals that will feed the staff, the insurance that they have to take for the staff members. In other parts of the world, it's very common, but in Ghana here, it is not. When you take staff to come and work at an event, you have to take up insurance to protect the staff in case any of them get hurt or something happens to them. You need insurance cover to be able to, to um, buffer that. Then you also need to spend on staff uniforms. Assuming you do not have the uniforms already, you have to create new ones. 
then the volunteers meals like i said you may not necessarily pay the volunteers money but you will have to provide them with food because they came to help and they will expend energy and perhaps you will want to give them some gifts to say thank you and then you may also want to give them sashes and armbands to identify them these are all elements of expenditure that they, they place under venue hire so like i said as an event professional you have to be smart when it comes to designing your budget and all the things i've been telling you about looking out for the budget and putting in place measures to buffer yourself in case what you forecasted for is not what you end up with is what we are going to discuss next which is called contingency planning now there are a number of negative surprises that can come up with events especially when it comes to the finances we learned about some of these negative surprises in risk management but with finances we need to look at it specifically through the lens of money that you have to spend now like i said when it comes to finances a lot of things can go wrong overnight you may need some spare finances somewhere to be able to recover if you have to successfully organize the event and achieve the target uh, objectives that you set. So for instance, like we learned from the example at the educational institution I was working with, when we are drawing budgets for our own events that we are organizing, even though we are using our own venue, we still budget um, for the use of the venue as part of the expenditure just to be able to provide a contingency in case on the day of the event, we are unable to have it at our own venue and we need to go and rent a separate location to have the event, right? So that is a typical example of contingency planning. Now, sometimes it may not be in relation to specific budget items, but it could be a lump sum that you set aside in case of any contingency, which you can put under perhaps the name of miscellaneous funds or contingency expenses. Right? And this is usually about 10% of the total cost of the event. So if the total, um, if the event is costing about $5,000 in total, you will use, you will take 10% of that amount as contingency, just in case something goes wrong or something doesn't uh, go quite right and you need extra finances to be able to buffer. Now this 10% is just a guide. Some event professionals ask for more. They may ask for 25 or 30%. Sometimes with the caveat that if after the event, no extra expenses are spent, we will give it back to you. And that is what we learned in one of our sessions is the guarantee that a lot of the event venue, the venue owners ask for. You have to make a deposit in view of any damages. And this is exactly what we are talking about here. Only in this case, we are referring to the event professional and how they can also buffer themselves against any unforeseen events or activities. Now, preparing for such things and planning for them in your budget and all, even though it protects you from any unforeseen financial expenditure that you have to, to incur, it also helps to show the stakeholders that you, the event professional, are prepared and you are aware of possible surprises and contingencies that may come up. And in that sense, it is a show of professionalism, which gives your, your client or the, the owner of the event the confidence that they are working with someone who has thought of even contingencies and therefore should anything even happen during the, the execution of the event, the event professional is up to the task to be able to ensure that it does not affect the successful execution of the event. Now, another thing that we need to talk about as event professionals is planning liquidity. And this is a very crucial element to the successful organization of events. Event budgets are known to explode just before the event or right after the event. And therefore, as an event professional, if you see the lump sum that you have to spend, and you begin by spending everything and paying off every single vendor before the event, just to be sure that you have cleared everything and everything can proceed, will put you in a very difficult and challenging situation. Because there are instances where some vendors have been paid full, have been paid in full, sorry, for the services they are supposed to render and they never show up. Who has experienced that before or knows someone who has experienced that before? I know so many stories. Can anyone share one such story? Can anyone share such a story? Okay, 
So basically, planning liquidity is one of the main reasons why we do not pay everybody in full. Does it make sense now? Yes, please. Good. Madam, I'm trying. I'm so, trying to understand. Yeah, so that is planning liquidity. So I know a couple who had they had money to organize their wedding and to be able to ensure that they do not have to, the headache of dealing with vendors after the wedding and all that. They paid everybody up front, including the photographer. They paid everybody in full, believing that on the day of the event, they will all show up. And for some interesting reason, the photographer never showed up. Before. In the end, they had to rely on attendees and the pictures that the attendees took with their phones to be able to get wedding pictures. Now, this is a typical example of how liquidity was not properly planned. So here we are saying that it is crucial for the event professional to have good planning with regards to who will be paid during the event, before the event, and after the event. There are some vendors that by nature of what they do and what they provide, if you do not pay them in full, you cannot guarantee them showing up. At the same time, too, there are some vendors that by virtue of what they do and how they behave, if you pay them everything up front, they may disappoint you. So with planning liquidity, the event professional has to plan how much money they are going to use to pay who, when, where, and in what format. So spreading pay deadlines with service providers over long periods of time before and after the event is often the way to go. Because that way you are ensured that you have enough money on you in case something happens in the event that you have to be able to use that money to solve. And then after the event, you can resolve the rest of the payment you have to make once the event has been successfully executed. But in the event that you have used all the money to pay off all the vendors before the event is to place, and you have no money left, no liquidity left, and something happens, you have no finances to fall upon, and you may be tempted to dip into your own pocket to solve it. And once you do that, at the end of the event, there's no guarantee that the client will pay you back because they did not ask you to dip into your own coffers to solve this problem. But once you are able to manage liquidity and you use part of the budget to solve this problem, afterwards, when the vendors want to be paid, you can make a good case to the clients that we had the budget or we had to use to solve this problem. So now we have to finish paying the client and perhaps you may have to top up. So that is it for planning liquidity. But most importantly, like I've been telling you from the beginning of this course, it is very important to have written agreements for every single activity, every single decision that is taken along the way of planning and executing events. And these have not always been part of the agenda in the events business because we have learned from this class, from even our own experiences amongst us, that there are even some of us who did not have written agreements with certain people and they are owing them money to date and have refused to pay because there's no written agreement back in it. So here we are saying that many event professionals have had to learn from bad experiences as a result of not having written agreements with clients or suppliers or vendors covering specific aspects of the event planning and organizing process. So where financial management is concerned, a contracting service provider means that there is a clear understanding of the costs. So without a written agreement to clearly outline the costs that are involved and how these costs are going to be addressed, there is no way to guarantee that both sides will keep their end of the value. So if from the beginning, like we've seen from the myriad of contracts that I have shown to you throughout this course, for caterers, venues, um, event uh, um, stakeholders, among others, you know there should be a written agreement to govern every single agreement that happens between an event professional and any stakeholder throughout the event management process. So if it is a, a, a supplier who is supplying you with a particular service, the terms of, 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 the, of the agreement are stated, what they are providing, how much of it they are providing, how much they are providing it at, how much of their payments they are receiving up front as a deposit and how much they'll be receiving by the end. Or if everything is also going to be paid outright, it should also be stated in the agreement. 
And this provides a good legal framework that leads to fewer problems and fewer misunderstandings when there's some amount of confusion regarding who has earned what and who should be paid what. And in the event that these misunderstandings end up in the court of law or in, the, in, 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 a, in an, arbit an arbitration forum, it becomes easier to handle the potential conflicts that will ensue because there's a written agreement to that effect. And everybody signed in agreement to the terms that have been contained in the document. And therefore, there's nothing like, I did not know or I did not agree because you would have signed to that effect. Please, does it make sense? Yes. Thank you. So. Okay. Next, we can talk about setting priorities. And with regard to setting priorities, we are saying that event professionals have to have an understanding of the essentials and desirables when they are budgeting. Now, when event professionals are excited in doing their job, sometimes they forget about what is essential and what is durable and tend to throw in everything, including the kitchen sink. Now, the problem with that is that the budget that you have may not enable you to be able to do all these fanciful things that you are thinking about. Therefore, the event professional needs to be able to set priorities beginning from the point where the client has clearly delineated what they want the event professional to execute. Now, on the basis of that, the event professional can easily prioritize knowing what the client is looking for and what they expect to see to be able to judge the event as having been successfully executed. So in the event planning phase, internally between the different functions and external forces from stakeholders must try to bind as many economic resources as possible because you have to be able to make sure that regardless of all the pump and pageantry you want to put in, what you have agreed on during the planning phase, during the discussions that went on, during your discussions and agreements with the stakeholders and the various suppliers and vendors and all the people involved are adequately addressed so that you do not exceed the resources that you have been allotted. So having a clear appreciation of the strategies that you and your team are going to use in accordance with the goals and objectives that you intend to achieve based on the job description that you have been given by your clients, as well as your stakeholders who have an interest and influence would help to distinguish between the desirables being the fanciful things that you want to do as an event professional, the moving stage, the cascading lights and flowers, and the essentials, like having security at the car park and having hand sanitizing stations throughout the room. So as an event professional, it is very important to set your priorities on the basis of the job description that you have been given by your clients. And next, we want to talk about value in kind sponsorships. And these ones I talked about briefly earlier when I was referring to the fact that they are a possible source of revenue. And these are very often underestimated because everyone thinks first about financial um, income when we talk about sponsorship, true or false. Whenever we talk about sponsorship, the first one that the first thing that comes to people, people's minds is money. True or false? Yes. Yeah. True. But in True. Ghana, with the experience I have with event organizing and, and, and working with some event professionals, it is very rare that you will get sponsorship in cash. They will always do it in one way or another in kind. A typical example, for instance, is the Coca-Cola example that I gave. Some years back, the business school students went to Coca-Cola asking for resources to be able to um, stage their management day student activities. And Coca-Cola said, okay, we do not have money to give you, but we will provide you refreshments to be able to refresh all the students throughout the week. So throughout the week that they were celebrating the management day, there was always a Coca-Cola stand with all the Coca-Cola drinks. I remember at that time, they were trying to promote Minute Maid. So there was a lot of Minute Maid on campus for everybody to drink in all the different flavors because they wanted to promote it. And that was the only way they agreed to sponsor the event. So that is one value in kind sponsorship. 
I remember I partnered with Ecobank Ghana as well to be able to um, launch my report on digital strategy in Ghana. And they said that, okay, we don't have money to give you, but we can be able to fund the printing of the report and then you can use our state-of-the-art conference room to launch your event. And then we will give you free media coverage. So in the end, the event was widely publicized. A lot of media houses, we had it in their flash conference room at the Ecobank head office. And then they paid the graphic designer who designed the event for them, who designed the, the report and, 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 and they paid for the printing as well. But no money came to me. That is an example of value in kind sponsorship. Right? So sponsorship is not always related to cash income. It can also come in the form of various favors or acts in kind or products that can be tested on a potential clientele. Like I said, when Coca-Cola agreed to sponsor, they didn't even bring Coca-Cola itself or Fanta or Sprite to their place. They only brought Minute Meal because at that time they were trying to launch Minute Meal on the market. So they brought Minute Meal throughout the weekend. Everybody didn't have a choice than to bring the Minute Meal because that was what was available and it was for free. And because of that, Minute Maid gained a lot of visibility among the, the customers on campus. So for, for event organizers, value in kind helps obtain services that would otherwise have been bought, which in turn helps you to save money. Because like I said, in that partnership with Ecobank, there's no way I could have rented that their state of the art conference room to launch my digital report because it would have cost me a lot of money, which I did not have at that point in time. So it saved me the money of having to launch the event. And I also got to, of having to launch the event at that venue. And I also got to benefit from the prestige of having it at the Ecobank head office in their plush conference room, right? So that is it for valuing kind sponsorships. And then finally, the most important thing is knowledge. As an event professional, you cannot, underestimates the power of knowledge. Because having knowledge of how to organize an event, especially the financial aspects of the event is essential. In the business school, for instance, we always have these short courses that we organize for professionals in the field to acquire various management skills that help them to effectively manage their businesses. And there are several ones, including essentials of bookkeeping for event professionals, among others, essentials of sales management, essentials of marketing and basic skills like that to help SMEs and entrepreneurs and business owners effectively manage their activities. And here, with regard to financing business, the knowledge that is offered in terms of bookkeeping and in terms of taxation and understanding financial management systems are very crucial because it helps you to be able to understand the specific legal regulations that apply to your business as an event professional. And without knowing what to do, you will not even know who you have to consult and what you have to be able to put in, in place, especially with regard to all these written agreements that we are talking about and managing your books and budgeting and, and preparing for risks and creating and designing events and getting ownership of these events. These are all matters that have to do with regulation, legalities, taxation, bookkeeping, among others. So specifically in terms of managing finances, a basic understanding of financial management tools such as bookkeeping, breaking, break-even analysis, among others, is very, very important to help you as an event professional to be able to appropriately manage your books and budget properly and handle your finances. And you also need to be able to be sure that this knowledge that you have is not just applied to one event. Like I said, the experiences that are gained from the various events must culminate in a set of experiences that you carry through to organizing other events in other contexts, in other environments. Because no one event will be the same. But with the multiple experiences that you have gained and earned along the way, you will be able to adequately prepare for unforeseen activities and events that will come up throughout your event management career. So knowledge is very important because that is what will help you to be able to surmount the various challenges that you are presented with over the course of your career as an event professional. And with that, we've come to the end of our session today.
Is there anything you need clarification on? Any question you would like to ask before we proceed? Um, 